Welcome everybody to tonight's UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man and my show host, my co-host, permanent co-host is Tom Reed from hey guys. UFO Park or the legendary Berkshire's UFO Encounter. Wow, now that, that's an introduction. I hope you're as respectful to David here. Hey Dave, it's good to see you again. Good to, I guess we're gonna talk again. Good um, it's been you. minutes. <laughs> so good evening. yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing uh yeah, you know, what you've collected and a little bit more about uh you know where you're going with all this. So I've heard Absolutely. some exciting stuff is ahead. So of course. Hey forward. David, you may need to turn up your mic a little bit. Oh, okay. How's that? Any better? That's, that's better, yes. All right. Should I turn mine down, Tim? Or okay. <laughs> uh we have a special guest tonight, David Marler. He is the curator of the National UFO Historical Research Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, currently, he is at home in his archive working with the esteemed Micah Hanks from the, de <laughs> from the debrief. So say hi to Micah Hanks in the back there. Everyone. How's it going, guys? <laughs> so tonight we have two people online, so um, we got a lot to dig into. One thing I want to do, do uh, re I can't talk tonight. One thing I want to say is... David has accumulated one of the largest personal libraries of UFO books, journals, magazines, newspapers, microfilms, audio recordings, and case files from around the world that covers the last 75 plus years. In November of 2020, he became the recipient of the world's single largest historical collection of UFO case files and initiated a project to digitize them to assist with the research. Due to his role as curator for these files and his track record of credible historical research, he was offered and accepted the rare invitation of serving as a full board member with Dr. J. Allen Hynek Center for UFO Studies, or CUFOS. David received his Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. He currently works in the healthcare field for a New Mexico-based hospital network and resides in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area with his wife and two daughters. So there's what we know so far about David Marler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's also planning to go to Grand Cayman pretty soon. So that's pretty <laughs> cool. Love Grand Cayman. Yeah. We have a lot to talk about when you get back. Absolutely. Uh, I, also, <laughs> I, need, I need to read something real quick about our, our secondary guest who's Micah Hanks from the debrief. <laughs> and here we go. Micah Hanks is a writer, researcher, and longtime advocate for scientific research into unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAP. He is a contributing member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, or SCU, and co founder and editor in chief of the debrief a news site devoted to science, defense, and technology where they also speak about UAPs. He is the author of several books and has contributed articles and essays to various anthologies related to the UAP subject. So please welcome Micah Hanks. There you go. Well, that's a surprise. I didn't know I had an intro tonight, but thank you so much. <laughs> yes. You gave me yeah. that one too. I was like really surprised. It's like he's, he's in a good mood tonight. You have an intro. Nobody's um, the National UFO Research Center has a logo, and here's the logo. Oh, beautiful logo. There we are. It's a very cool logo, yes. Uh, what inspired you to make this logo, David? Well, uh, the logo itself, uh, we really wanted to do a departure from the usual imagery that you see associated with the UFO subject. In other words, we didn't want the trite little flying saucer or the little gray alien with almond eyes waving at you. Um, and the reason for that is we really want to elevate the discourse related to this subject, especially now, as I think you and your audience can appreciate, given the level of media attention, given the level of attention at, on Capitol Hill, along with the intelligence agencies here in the United States, we felt that there was a missing component to the dialogue. Uh, if you look at the 2017 moving forward narratives within uh, media and on various talk shows, everyone is focusing the dialogue very tightly scripted to 2004 USS Nimitz moving forward. And I'm sitting here amongst all this data and I'm thinking to myself along with my historical colleagues, how come no one is talking about the history of this subject? 75 years, seven and a half decades worth of data that we're sitting on. 
And so we decided that we need to really uh, add a missing component to this dialogue and namely bringing all of the historians, all of the archivists that have historical data that, to be quite honest, uh, Tim and Tom, that a lot of the general public has never seen before. And so we have hundreds of thousands of case files here just in the, in the uh, addition of my home here in our, our private research room. And we have numerous collections scattered across the country. All of these historians I've been working with, and we have been gathering all this data together, but it's decentralized. And many of these researchers are much older than myself. I'll be 55 this year. And many of these individuals are pushing 70 or pushing 80. And so they need to decide what's going to happen to their collections. Many researchers in the past have uh, died without making succession plans. And a lot of this material that's sitting behind me wound up in landfills because the family didn't make any arrangements. The researcher didn't make any arrangements. So we decided we're not going to lose any more historical data. We're going to try to preserve the historical record. So uh, we've entered into an agreement, my colleagues and I uh, on our team, that all of their material will come to Albuquerque. It will be housed in one location where we can make it available to the general public, to academics, but also to the government if they're interested in, in having access to this material to provide context for what's being reported today, which I believe the history does that. And so we create a logo as a, a face for the organization, one that really looks like a quasi-official agency. And we want to operate, operate in a quasi-official capacity with government and with academics. And in fact, just recently, uh, we had a lot of media coverage when our press release went out in November. We were the front page top news story on the Albuquerque Journal. As a result of that, I've been invited to speak in May, believe it or not, at Kirtland Air Force Base on the Whoa, cool. And so it's just an example of elevating, as I said, that discourse, really uh, approaching uh, a wider audience. Uh, I think we've all done a fair job of trying to expand the dialogue over the years. Right. But I myself included in this this forthcoming indictment against the UFO community, I think we do a great job of preaching to the choir. Uh, it's very hard to kind of break past the, the confines of our small little insular group right. and reach people in the scientific community within the military. And I'm here to tell you, in the, the 10 years I've lived here in Albuquerque, I've given local lectures and almost every lecture that I finish inevitably someone comes up and says, David, I really appreciate the historical lecture, the credibility you're bringing to the subject. By the way, I'm a research scientist that work at Los Alamos or Sandia National Laboratories. And so scientists are interested in this subject, even before the 2017 uh, change in the narrative with the government getting interested overtly right. in the subject. And so th that's where we're at. We want to really centralize, preserve the data, but also we're working uh, feverishly to digitize this material, because admittedly, many people can't come to Albuquerque to see the physical materials. In the last month and a half, with the assistance of my two daughters, I have to give them credit, they've been helping me with this, we've digitized 13,800 pages of uh, historic NICAP UFO case files. We're wow. trying to completely digitize this body of data that has, for decades, quite literally resided only as hard copies. If God forbid anything happened to those hard copies, we would lose that data. So we're very close. And in fact, by the middle of the summer, I hope to have the entire historic NICAP KUFOS case file collection fully digitized. There's actually the, the picture there is where what I basically did during COVID lockdown, going through all these case files and working on digitizing those and pulling a lot of triangular UFO cases that I found in the historical record. And that's some of the uh, government documents there. That one is actually an official Air Force document signed by the base commander. Uh, just one of many original government documents we have here as part of Dr. J. Allen Hynek's historic Project Blue Book files. And this is a great collection. I also did this during COVID lockdown. Over 260 reel-to-reel -reel and cassette recordings dating back to the late 1950s of rare interviews with UFO witnesses and rare radio broadcasts that quite literally, some of these may be the only surviving recordings of some of those, but now all of those tapes you see there are now digitized. And many of those tapes corresponded with the NICAP case files that resided in Chicago. These tapes were in Seattle, Washington with our team member, Rod Dyke. 
not only did we digitize these, but we were able to reunite the interview tapes with the physical case files from NICAP from the 50s, 60s. And there's Mr. Rod Dyke. That's who actually donated those rare historical recordings to us. And Rod has an incredible collection. For those that know their history, Rod has the personal files and collections of Donald Kehoe, as well as Richard Hall, who were, of course, the two pivotal members of the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. I think I have this photo yet. Ah, microfilm. We, I was just actually showing Micah here, who's been doing research this weekend. Uh, we have reels and reels of microfilm. That one there is actually from a series of microfilms that Project Blue Book owned. And there was a gentleman in the 1960s by the name of Herbert Strentz who went to Blue Book, ATIC, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and met with Hector Quintanella. He, uh, Hector Quintanella was running late for the meeting, and the gentleman was standing there, and he saw all these small boxes sitting on file cabinets. And Hector Quintanella came rushing in and apologized for his tardiness. And he said, that's all right. I was just admiring all these little boxes you have sitting here. He goes, oh, those were microfilms that we had made. During the summer wave of 1952, there were so many reports that we subscribed to a news clipping service. And uh, Edward Ruppelt actually references this in his classic book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. And he said, I was just admiring these, these boxes. And he said, yeah, he goes, we have those. We were actually getting ready to incinerate those. He goes, would you be interested in them? And he goes, of course I would. He wow. goes, in fact, the, th the, the thesis of my work is looking at how the media covers the UFO subject. Long story short, he eventually wrote his, his uh, monograph on media coverage of flying saucers in the 50s and 60s, uh, it, but essentially took all of these microfilms from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Hector Quintanella released those to him. He sat on those for decades, and then fast forward to the 1970s, 1980s, uh, he got put in touch with Barry Greenwood. And Barry Greenwood was really fascinated by this and was fascinated by the microfilms he obtained. And Strentz, much like Quintanella said, oh, I was getting ready to get rid of those. I really have no use for them. Would you like to have them? So this really demonstrates how some of this material exchanges hands over many years and many decades. Long story short, those microfilms now reside here. And we just actually paid Barry and I out of pocket, paid about $1,200, had those and a number of other microfilms professionally digitized. And so eventually we want to upload those online so people can have access to hundreds of thousands of news clippings. I also got this picture. Ah, yeah. There's over about 1,500 books on the UFO subject and uh, not only uh, domestic, but also foreign books. Uh, in April and May of this uh, past year, uh, 2022, uh, I actually obtained Antonio uh, Huneas' files. And he had a number of uh, books, rare books uh, from the United States, but also many uh, from Europe and many South American countries. And so uh, some very rare uh, manuscripts. And in fact, I have a gentleman here in Albuquerque who I met in Roswell when I saw Tom last last year. And he and his wife are volunteering here at the Record Center. And he is translating the Spanish material into uh, English. In fact, Antonio Huneas had copies of Spanish Air Force files that have never been translated into English. And that project's currently underway by my friend Diego and his wife, Euphoria. I have to say, a lot of people say, why do UFO sightings only occur in the United States? I, I get that <laughs> comment a lot underneath a lot of my videos. And yeah. It's like, that's not the case. They occur everywhere. And everywhere. You, you need to take a look at the data, the chain of data, and know that you have established the National UFO Historical Research Center. Yeah. Perhaps people will be able to get a hold of that data and take a look. Absolutely. And one of the things that we're trying to establish also, as you can appreciate, Tim, to your point, people can access the data and people erroneously think, well, it's all online. I can just Google UFOs and I'll find all the information. You're going to find a lot of information. You're going to find a lot of disinformation. You're going to find a lot of misinformation. Right. The beautiful thing is, and for those that have attended my lectures over the years, I always cite my references. And I was just remarking to uh, our, our visiting researcher, Micah, here uh, earlier today that if anyone ever questions where does David Marler get his data, come here. I'll show you the original news clippings. I'll show you the original government documents. I'll show you the original project. Yeah. It's all about right. source documents. Exactly, Tom. Right. It's all about the provenance because there's right. so much spurious information. So much garbage out there. 
And oh, uh, I don't gosh. believe every story. I'm very oh, skeptical. You, you know. But I, I reference and I try to cross-reference this information. In fact, there's a case from 1964 that I resurrected. Uh, APRO back in the, the mid-60s investigated this case. It was uh, a, a, an eight-year-old boy that was apparently burned by a UFO. I remember reading this when I lived in St. Louis, but there wasn't much I could do living in the Midwest. I didn't have the research funds to go research it out here in New Mexico. But once I was out here, I decided I'm going to look into that. I obtained audio recordings from James McDonald of his interviews four years after the event in 1968 with the boy, the mother, and the grandmother who witnessed this occur. And I still wasn't convinced. I'm still like, well, I want to see some con contemporaneous documents that might support that this really happened. I went to the University of New Mexico where I've lectured on the UFO subject and where I do a lot of my research in their vast microfilm library. And I found the original newspapers on microfilm. Not only did it document the event, it documented the subsequent hospitalization and investigation by police and the FBI that were called in. What a so there was a lot of data. And then fast forward in time to 2020, I got what's just off camera here, the NICAP KUFOS case files. In the Blue Book files of Hynek and in the NICAP case files, I found numerous news clippings of similar incidents that played out in Northeast Georgia within an 85 mile radius of one another, all describing essentially what was described three weeks prior in Hobbs of a black top shaped object belching flame out the bottom that actually burned other individuals. Do you know where that was in Georgia? Because I live on the Georgia line. I'm right outside Absolutely. Atlanta. Um, uh, Gainesville, Georgia was one of the locations. La uh, Livonia, Georgia was where one of the major incidents played out. And in fact, I'm in touch with the gentleman, the first witness in the Georgia series of sightings. Mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman passed away about two or three years after the event uh, due to a heart attack. Nothing that we know uh, that was related to the UFO incident. But I'm in touch with the granddaughter. And the gentleman's widow is still alive. I believe she's in her 90s. What year was this? Do you know? It was in 1964. <clears throat> I live not far from Y12 or uh, Oak Ridge, which is only about two and a half hours from Atlanta. I'll have and to send you are, all my information on this, Tom. There are si sightings all the time around here. I'd and love to send you my case files on that. I'll have to I'll have to yeah, do I'll email yeah. for I'd you. I'd like to see what you have on my case. I, I'm going to research that. Yeah, absolutely. Are you, are you familiar with uh, General Assembly 33426? No, I'm not. It was uh, an uh, it was a, an idea by uh, Muhammad Rabin, who was the president of the Parapsychology Society in the 70s, mm -hmm. to have all our countries share their information together. Oh. And uh, there was a hearing in 1974, and mm -hmm. then it was uh, heard again in 1992 because it didn't pass. Okay. But your neighbor, Linda Morton Hall, was there. Sure. And our family's attorney was there representing our case. Okay. So that might be something you might want to look at. It was uh, it was called uh, uh, it was extraterrestrial intelligence a human future, and okay. it was GA thirty three four twenty six. It's actually quite profound because the entire uh, country um, and you know Mexico was there. Uh, my God, it was so many different. Uh, uh, representatives uh, sharing the sightings from other countries prefer mostly mexico they were they i remember i still got some of the stuff my father brought back oh uh, about a fire jet being paralyzed to fire and how one of the statements at the united nations this is 1992 um that we were as much of a threat to them as they were to us mm. and it's in black and white well, it's so, funny you say that because when I first got involved in, in UFOs back in 1990, I always thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if we had a, a, a Nash, uh, United Nations of UFO researchers? Yeah, and yes. uh, it really speaks to that, Tom. That, and, yeah, that's uh, the idea of it. And actually. it's still needed. It's still mm -hmm. needed, right? Yeah. We still need to try to work towards something like that. Yeah. Okay, I got to stop you guys for a second. I, I got a super sticker and I need to play a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that was nice. Not as exciting as the Backstreet Boys of the uh, the <laughs> aliens there line dancing together, but it was okay. <laughs> so I got a question. Um, 
For those online, I'm sure they're familiar with the Ro International UFO Museum in Roswell and the Research Center. And uh, of course, then there's the Black Vault. So what, um, how, how are you different, if you would, or, or you know, was there, um, if you could sh shed some light on? Absolutely, Tom, that's, and that's a great question. Uh, to be clear, and I'm really glad you're bringing this point up, we're not here to compete with existing libraries, archives, museums. Rather, we want to be complementary to that. And in fact, that was in our press release that we want to work collaboratively worldwide, again, taking that global nature that we were discussing right before the break, and uh, essentially work and collaborate and share data. But the rationale for it, Tom, to be quite honest, was uh, as I was lecturing the country the last few years, individuals, and quite literally just this past year, 2022, I did a series of lectures uh, across the country as well as Nova Scotia. At every venue, I had at least one person come up stating they had historical material and they wanted to donate it. And with all due respect, this is their words, not mine. They said, uh, I don't want to have it thrown away. I don't want it destroyed. And I don't want it going to the Roswell UFO Museum. I really would like to see it go to a more academic setting, uh, something that would be more readily accessible. Uh, admittedly, Roswell is a little far off the beaten path for those that have been out there as we have. Um, and so in, in addition, talking to academics here in Albuquerque, and as I alluded to at the, the, the first uh, part of the show, I talked about talking to scientists from Sandia National Laboratories and Los Alamos National Laboratories. Um, they, when I mentioned the Roswell UFO Museum, they kind of roll their eyes. And it's kind of a tourist attraction, but it's not something that's garnering serious academic and scientific attention. Scientists aren't going there. Typically, UFO enthusiasts and families are going there. Uh, and so we thought we really need to do something, as I said earlier, really to elevate the discourse. Uh, we, we don't want it to be something that's, uh, you know, predicated on a gift shop. We don't want it uh, that's predicated, to be quite honest, on one case. Admittedly, the Roswell event is the, the linchpin for the museum there, the interpretive center. We really want something that stands by itself that's not really reliant on one particular right. case. So you're but more of our archivable research uh, well, library. Yeah, exactly, Tom. In fact, the way I was pitching it before I really thought that this would come to fruition, mm -hmm. I was saying what we need, and I said this at the UFO Congress actually in October of last year, what we need is the National Archives of Ufology. And, and that's really kind of, I think we can all wrap our minds around that idea. That was really the concept, an academic serious location where uh, mm -hmm. the general public certainly is welcome. UFO yeah. enthusiasts are welcome, but something, and again, we go back to the logo, something that doesn't have a logo that might deter right. serious academics and scientists from gracing right. our doors. Sense. Yeah, it yeah. We try to we try really hard to also stay on the uh, mainstream side of things because, right. um, and I get criticized for it sometimes. You know, why aren't you doing this event or why aren't you doing that? But yeah, um, no matter you what you do, you're going you to have a United States history. There's also a responsibility in our part to treat it as such. Exactly. And, it, it, um, it, right. Yeah. You, for any of us that have been to any other historical archive, that's really kind of the template by which we're trying to create this. Do you and, break uh, your? I'm sorry. Okay, go, ahead. No, go ahead. Do you break up like like what we're all seeing here? Is that I guess that's a lion's share of everything, or would you say that's just one room? Or? Oh no, that's just one small portion actually. And of again, course. keep in mind this is just <laughs> this is just my physical collection currently. We have five right. to six other large collections, literally the largest collections in the country, destined to come here once we get a freestanding facility, which I'm currently working on with local business leaders. Okay. In fact, I have a meeting uh, next week, uh, a follow-up meeting to discuss that and actual talk business numbers that we're going to be presenting. And we're also looking at potentially getting some state funding as well to help with this project. I hope that works out. Well, I, can I, one more question there, Tim. I'm sorry. Just one second. So sure. I am the co-host. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I, I know, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. So, um, my question then is when you find something that is, I guess, uh, you know, a fictional, you know, account right. versus something that, my God, this has some substance. Right. How do you break that up and what do you do with what you find to be credible versus I'm not really sure right. versus this is nonsense? Right. Well, one of the things that we want to do uh, first and foremost, I can talk, I can answer that question two ways. Individually, I like to lecture and present and share credible information. But at the same time, Tom, I think it's important that we do call out 
if I can say it, BS when it's actually BS. Right. Yeah, because at this uh, point, at, at this point, it's hurting more than it's helping. The, these crazy little tales. I for agree. those on the, on the chat here, for Tim who's seen something firsthand, right. I've seen something, you know. Right. And then we we see all this attention going to something that we all know is not true. And then right. you're, you know, you're talking about someone that may not have the proof that they need, but you know they had a an actual sighting, and you right. want to support that person, but it's overshadowed by the wow. I know. Yeah, I it know. seems like the wow channels are huge, and the ones that want to present credibility are not. Well, and I've always said this that it's just human nature. Unfortunately, sensation sells. The more sensational it is, the more clicks you're going to get, the more views you're going to get online, and but it's really sad, though, because I think we can all agree, as well as your audience, the reality of this phenomenon is sensational enough. It does not right. need embellishment. It does right. not need to be overly exaggerated. So and the truth actually is more interesting than the wow, because the wow always goes in the same direction. But it's the little details on the on those cases that you get. Right. Go, my God, this really this guy is telling the truth. I can just tell. I can see it. I feel it. He feels Absolutely. it. And you have another witness to back it up, and it may not be something that's going to take you on a half-hour ride. Absolutely, but those little details mean a lot, and it's the devil's great. in the details. Absolutely, right. absolutely. I mean, Tom, I said uh, earlier, I, I can answer this two ways. One, I can talk on behalf of myself. Now, as far as the National UFO Historical Records Center goes, and this was something that we we envisioned very early on, and we really thought about and deliberated about as an organization. We do not take a stance on any one particular case or individual. We feel our job is to collect, centralize, and make available the data. It is incumbent upon the person visiting to judge that data and judge for themselves what they deem to be credible or not credible. We had a question in the chat, which was, how do us normal people access the data? Do you have a hotline to call in on? Um, Good question. For reporting UFO sightings. Well, I'm assuming the question means I'm abnormal. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, no. Uh, normal part, <laughs> what normal subjective, right? Yeah, exactly. um, no, that's a great question. Uh, the best way is to contact us through our website, uh, www.nufohrc.org. And that's the best conduit for reaching out to us because it's not just myself. Uh, I have uh, my, uh, Jay, who's my uh, chief strategist. He helps with the business aspects. He monitors the website. Uh, we have people like Micah. There we go. There's the website. And uh, we have our entire team that helps field. As I mentioned, currently, all, the collective data is decentralized. So uh, if I don't have my records here in Albuquerque, I'll reach out to Barry Greenwood in Stoneham, Massachusetts. If Barry doesn't have that material, we'll, we'll reach out to Jan Aldridge in Connecticut, or we'll reach out to Seattle. But chances are we may have something that actually fulfills a, re a data request. And I will tell you, I don't often mention this, but I do get data requests all the time. Uh, you know, Tom and I were just talking, I'm going to be doing a data search for him uh, tonight or tomorrow uh, on the Berkshires. And, uh, but I get requests uh, from all types of people, people that say, when I was in college, I remember that there were sightings in Michigan. Would you mind looking to see if there was anything around that time? I have people that say that they had a sighting and I remember it was in the newspaper, but I don't remember which newspaper it was, but the sighting occurred at this location at this date. Would you mind uh, helping me with that? And also uh, a number of authors. Uh, I have an author uh, uh, that was just out here from New York, uh, a major uh, pictorial historical book on the history of UFOs will be coming out later this fall. And uh, Mark Hartsman is the author. And Mark spent a number of days here collecting numerous case files and visual elements to incorporate into that book. And uh, we're very happy to have the National UFO Historical Records Center listed as a source for that upcoming book. Uh, and a number of researchers that your audience would recognize the names. Uh, you know, James Fox has been out here collecting information for the phenomenon. Uh, I've had uh, a number of different researchers out here. I've had researchers from Colorado. Um, I've had researchers from other countries coming through for various reasons, either going to Roswell or coming through to look at Socorro or many of the different UFO sites we have here. And so uh, I just try to make that data available to everyone. In fact, before I forget, we're talking about how we're starting to get a wider audience looking at this subject. I've been doing this now for 33 years. And last year, I did a local radio show. And in fact, I'll be doing one uh, this coming Friday uh, for Albuquerque Live Radio. 
and it was a call-in show. And I was talking about the fact that I'm currently reorganizing uh, Dr. G. Allen Hynek's Project Blue Book Files. And I said, there's some tantalizing little aspects in there. The Blue Book Files are out there ostensibly online, but Hynek's files are unique because it has many different commentaries and marginalia. Quite often you hear that Hynek, Hynek's skepticism eroded later in years, and they talk about the Socorro incident. I have case files from the 1950s, right. 52, 53, where already he was taking issue with the Air Force, and they would have official explanations. Little side notes, notes, right? Exactly, Tom. Yeah. He, would, he would cross through it, and he always yeah. typically wrote, as Micah was looking at earlier today, yeah. with red felt pen. He would cross it out, and in, in bold letters underneath write, unidentified. And he would always abbreviate Air Force as AF, and he would often write, why didn't AF investigators interview other witnesses? Why didn't AF investigators obtain right. radar that was- Side kind of notes are as exciting to read as anything else. Oh, it, well, it, Tom, you said it earlier, the devil's in the details. And it right. gives you insight right. into the man, and it gives you insight into these cases that you won't find in the official Blue Book record. And so it's really interesting when you have that information. But I mentioned this on this radio show, and to my surprise, a caller called in. He said, Dave, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I would love to come and see the Air Force's Project Blue Book files that you have of Hynix. Long story short, I told him, get with the producer, get your contact information. I'll reach out. We'll line something up. About three weeks later, we coordinated our schedules. He not only came out, but right before he came out that morning, he said, David, do you mind if I bring a colleague of mine? I said, sure, that's fine. And I said, who is he? He said, well, he's a retired colonel in the Air Force. He was in charge of advanced weapons development when he was active in the Air Force. And they both wanted to come over and access and see Hynix files. And the reason I say that that's a game changer right now is because doing this for up to that point, almost 31, 32 years, I've done radio shows. I've done local TV call-in shows. Never had retired Air Force officers want to come to my home to actually see the material that I was gathering. But because of the changing narrative post-2017 with the New York Times article, I'm getting right. requests like that. I'm having active and retired military contacting me, expressing interest in the data that we're gathering. It's about time, too. Amen. Actually. Amen. Um, I actually had the um, luxury of interviewing Ralph Blumenthal uh, yes. in 2020, um, three years after he helped uh, come out with that article with That's Leslie right. Keen and that one other uh, journalist. Mm -hmm. So um, he gave me really good insight on that and how he felt that this was going to open up a can of worms. It was and a changing moment. Yes. It has really assisted us in our quest for uh, getting the information out there. And I mean, the credible information, the chain of data supported information, which is difficult to find uh, throughout all the noise that's in a the UFO community and B, Absolutely. Uh, w outside the UFO community, you're trying to get it out there, but other things seem to overshadow it. I agree. Uh, currently, it's like the UFO um, uh, phenomenon has been hushed down a little bit. Yeah. Even with that new uh, UAP report coming out. Right. Uh, which to me was almost laughable. Uh, but I've heard from other people that the classified version uh, was significant. Hmm. And that a lot of the people behind the scenes that are, are seeing this data right. uh, can't wrap their head around it because they're, uh, they're like you and I being that, uh, they may or may not have seen this information before. Right. And so when they see it and it's right there and it's unidentified and we can't tell what it is, it just totally changes the world paradigm. Now, when I saw my UFOs with 12 other people, I'm telling you, it, I knew right then and there we weren't alone. Right. Just like Tom did. I was going right, to say, Tom, Tom could, could could join in on this discussion. Yeah, it would change my life for sure. You know, I was an altar boy carrying a cross on a church, you know, and having a sip of wine at nine years old and having following that with a wafer. And I was <laughs> like, you know, all of a sudden everything just, uh, you know, I, I used to sit on top of my parents had racehorses and I used to sit on top of the stable mm -hmm. and I would just sit there by myself looking out over the hills and, and um, just feeling like, the way I used to 
I used to talk to myself kind of thing about what happened because I, it was hard to talk to people because you were, you know, ostracized, right? For lack of a better word. Right. And so I would sit there and think to myself and picture in my head this fork. And like, for some reason, I just felt like my life had been going this way and now it shifted completely. And I was just like this fork in the road. And now yeah. nothing that I had learned before or, or thought to, or, or believed in or, or felt to be accurate or true was all changed. You know, everything, my feeling on how we got here and I was pretty young, you know, but uh, nine, 10 years old, but I was like, you know, what, what we just went through and what we saw and what was discussed openly in the community had not only me, but a lot of the children drawing these things and sketching these little, draw, you know, pictures of what they saw and taping up the chalkboards and yeah. there was communication on the bus. And, and so there was this group that kind of formed that were all part of this, but they couldn't really for say, discuss it with, you know, someone else. And well, by the way, we we're also involved in the space race. So a lot of the people in the area, like the goodwill matches, goodwill message that was left on the moon, those right. engineers and Sprague electric was right down the road from us. So a lot, a lot of them ate at our diner. So there's a lot of things you couldn't talk about for a number of reasons, sure. not just being picked on, if you will, or right. having uh, the, the local officer who was, you know, helping the kids cross the street to school snicker when you walked by or, right. you know, you name it. But, uh, I'll tell you this. So my mother had said to me, um, you know, you know, asked me what I wanted for my birthday or Christmas. I can't remember which. And I said a camera because if I ever saw it again, I wanted to get a picture of it. And that became my career. Wow. So in some respects, if you look at this, yeah, there were some things that, um, you know, were, were hard to deal with. Right. But it still changed my my uh, direction. That fork was was a, a you know an actual thing for me it wasn't well, no that, longer just this idea sitting on top of the stable that oh my god you know my feelings of this or my feelings of that were now altered it did actually yes. physically alter my entire life absolutely i'm really glad you're sharing that tom because i have said and again this is an, an indictment against myself and my fellow historians quite often we talk about history right and it's like history and in any other context how we were taught in school Location, place, event. Location, place, event, time. Uh, and it do, we do, sometimes I don't think emphasize enough the personal impact it has on the witness, on the experiencer, and how it does change their life. And I, I always love, to your point, Tom, uh, how people often say, well, why don't these UFOs just land on the White House lawn? And then people will often say, well, maybe it's like Star Trek. They have the non-intervention that we can't interfere with the lives of, you know, lesser <laughs> developing species. Yep. But to Tom's point and to other witnesses that are probably in your audience right now listening, right. To it, exactly. it has impacted. It's not non-intervention. Yes. They are intervening and impacting people's lives on a deeply personal and one might even argue spiritual level. Right. Well, it actually impacted me to the point of becoming UFO man. So, well, here you there are. You go. And here we are as a result. Right. And I've gotten to, I've gotten to talk to some very influential people in the field, such as yourself and Micah. So, sure. um, it's led me down a really interesting path. I've met mm -hmm. new friends and gained new uh, a new co-host. That's awesome. Thank you. And, and he I, is on a roll tonight. You uh, know. And I can't imagine myself not being part of this community, not being part of the dialogue, especially during these very exciting times as we're seeing uh, credibility being assigned to this subject uh, by officialdom. And I know there's a lot in the UFO community that tend to dissect every little statement, dissect every little thing like ACE, uh, ATIP and OSAP. And well, uh, Lou Elizondo said this, Chris Mellon said that. Okay, we can go down that rabbit hole. I choose not to. I've got enough on my plate actually dealing with the data. Right. Uh, but right. I think we need to take a step back, historically speaking. I'm going through some cases from the 1960s. And, you know, this is, you know, right before Blue Book shut down. And, of course, their conclusions, nothing 69. to UFOs. December 69. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. December 69, Siemens, uh, the chairman of the Air Force, uh, made the announcement that they're going to be shutting Blue Book down. But, you know, the conclusions, I would argue, when you look at the three conclusions, that there's nothing to UFOs that threaten national defense, uh, there's nothing beyond our scientific principles, and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. 
All of those conclusions that Blue Book arrived at have been directly or indirectly refuted by the latest Pentagon UFO UAP reports, uh, where they do say there is something. We don't know what it is. And the, the, the fundamental premise for these UAP reports, as you and your audience know, was based on the potential national security and air safety risks that these things could pose. Right. These, these contradict decades-long statements that the scientific sure. community and general public have hung their opinions on. And mm -hmm. so for those that come up to me when I do a lecture or for anyone yeah. that knows I, I'm interested in this subject, and they say, well, I don't believe in UFOs or I don't think there's anything to it. At this point, I feel validated to say, well, then you ha haven't been keeping up with the news because you need to get with the times. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And there's so much data out there to prove otherwise. I mean, oh my God. I, the hardest I hate to say this, but the hardest people I have talking to aren't everyday people. I can walk up to everyday people and say, hey, have you seen anything out in the fields when you're farming? Because I live in a rural town. So sure. it's kind of like, have you seen anything at night or during the day or over your barn or whatever? And invariably, I will get answers where people will say, yes, I saw some lights or I saw a disc or, you know, I, I get a lot of information from locals. But in regards to talking to evangelical people uh, and mentioning, hey, I believe in UFOs and they're real and they're possibly not from here from what I saw. And they're like, can't be, can't be, <laughs> you know, so. There are people out there that we still have to reach. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think it's still going to be a struggle, but it's worth the effort. And yeah. Well, there's some people that's not even worth trying to have a conversation well, with them. I was going to say, hard yeah, to make up their mind. It's not even worth it, you know. Yeah, Tom, I was just going to say the same thing. There are some people, no matter what you show them, I've already got my mind made up. Don't bother me with the facts. Yeah, it's not worth it. Move on. Well, I have you know? to honestly say something in regards to what I was saying before. I pulled this line on somebody in my family who is very devout. Mm -hmm. And I said, doesn't it say in the Bible, God created the heavens, plural, <laughs> and the earth? So heavens could mean multiverses, different realities, different planets. It could mean something other than spiritual heaven. Sure. It could be other places. Sure. And she's like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I said, well, read Ezekiel and see if you tell me if that's a UFO sighting. Right. Yeah. And it's, great. <laughs> and it's great when you can have that 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 intellectual dialogue. And the, right. the problem is with politics, religion, and even UFOs, I hate to say, I hate to throw those three together. Uh, right. Quite often the conversation operates from this and not this. Right. I'm trying to get a or, point. Or the other way around. Or the other way around. Right. 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 Uh, but I think it's worth the effort. I really yeah. do. Oh, yeah, and no, absolutely. With, with people like yourself and Micah working on it and yeah. all those other people that I wanted to mention that were on your team that I didn't get a chance to put out sure. there. Let's see here. We've got Michael Schratt. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, Michael, has, Michael has been here many times to do uh, research. In fact, we're trying to get him scheduled to come out in the next month or two to do some subsequent research, actually specifically to look, I believe, at uh, Hynix files. He's very good at artwork, too. Oh, incredible. And he really breathes life. I have to give him credit. Uh, he breathes life into these older cases by the visual elements, uh, Tim, to your point. He really, you know, creates, he gives depth to some of these, these to be honest with you, crude witness sketches that we often have uh, from right. some of these witnesses. Then we have Jan Aldrich. Jan Aldrich, Project 1947. Uh, you know, one of the the older researchers that I really look up to as far as collecting data. Jan has probably spent more time in archives across the country. And in fact, he, he was just doing a, a tour of some archives just last year. And, you know, he's getting up there in age, but he's probably spent more time in archives than any of us have spent in restaurants in our entire life. Wow. Uh, he spends days at a time sifting through case files, and sometimes it's a needle in a haystack. Uh, 90% is just, you know, general background information to find that one case file or that one news clipping or that one eyewitness report. But uh, Jan is, in a word, tenacious when it comes to doing research in archives. Mr. Barry Roth, uh, this is another visitor that's come here many, many times, uh, which is a, an obvious reason why they're on my team. 
Uh, Barry's done an incredible job of uh, really doing deep dives into historical research. In fact, Barry was here about a month or two ago and was collecting uh, uh, information from uh, the Canary Islands, uh, sightings that occurred in the 70s from the Canary Islands. He thought it was an isolated case. And as he was going through some of the English and Spanish speaking files, he found a number of other reports that apparently occurred around that same time. And again, I talked earlier about context. He thought it was just this when really there were commercial pilots that were seeing these things. The military was involved in tracking them. And he thought he was going to do a small little lecture. And it, it, it actually grew and evolved into this large presentation he's currently working on. And uh, again, you know, you don't know until you have access to these historical reservoirs of information. Do you find that uh, your researchers and, and, and those you're working with who have been working um, and uh, I guess taking an interest and, and taking a deeper dive into this more than most people would uh, maybe 10 years ago? Because, you know, these guys have been around the block, you know. Oh, absolutely. Um, you think that they're, uh, you know, they, they've had to have had some tough dinners, right? <laughs> some tough conversations. Absolutely. Um, and I was thinking, um, you know, there's a lot of people now jumping on board. There's a lot of people involved in this. A lot of people following this more than they ever did before. But now it's almost, uh, it's easier for people to do that because there is, a, it's, let's face it, they, they've admitted it's true, right? So absolutely, um, openly, you know, the news. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, those who, uh, you know, claw their way all these years, the ones that, uh, you know, it's, it's almost uh, a shame. There's a, there should be some like tribute to these people, right? Because well, nothing, nothing worth having or being part of comes easy. Right. So no. those who put this on the map are now being kind of overshadowed by the, the, you know, the news, the news anchor who's 27 yeah. years old and, and sporting D cups. Right. It's not like we're yeah, not absolutely. looking at the people who really made this happen. No, and Tom, I, it's again, shame that Stanton Friedman isn't around today, for instance. Exactly. Yeah, I, I've thought about that many times. It's like yeah. I wish we could have lived to see this day of, of validation. Yeah, I guess is the best word I can think of to to really underscore what you're saying. But to your point, when we decided that we really wanted to solidify this as a nonprofit organization, put a face, put a name to it, um, we decided that it, especially once we get our building, once we start putting this together and centralizing all of this. It's not just about the data, to your point, Tom. It's about the people. Literally, men and women in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that spent their adult livelihoods, their time, their treasury to gather this data. And now, in many cases, we're lucky enough to have some of that data, the stuff that didn't go to the landfill or get discarded. We owe it to their memory to commemorate them as much as the data that they collect. Exactly. Exactly my point. I, I completely agree with you. I mean, there's got to be some payback. There's so many people like we were picked on as kids, you know, just whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, we're certainly not the only ones, right? And so, well, yeah, so. if I may, uh, to your point also, I get a little, I, I'm, let me first, let me preface, I'm encouraged by more people coming into this. That is a good thing. The more eyes and brains we have focused on the problem, great. Right. I'm I'm disillusioned by the instant experts that seem to be coming out of the woodwork. People right. that have no history of involvement studying the subject, yet they have this big voice and they're getting bandwidth thanks to media. Sure, and they're banging out paperbacks, you know, exactly. left and they're right. going they're to never conventions. Even, they've never even yeah. in a exactly. UFO in their life. I yeah. respect the people that show longevity in this field. And again, right. some of the people on our team, Barry Green Greenwood, Jan Aldridge, decades. Barry Greenwood started collecting historical material in 1964, long before some of these UFO luminaries were even born. Right. Um, I can honestly say UFO man's been around eight years. So <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on longevity. So there you go. Okay, here's another person. Mr. Mm -hmm. Rob Swiatek. Yeah, uh, Rob is actually on the uh, board of International MUFON. Uh, he's also worked for the Fund for UFO Research. Uh, he's worked collaboratively with the Center for UFO Studies and MUFON over many, many years. And uh, he has uh, a number of historical items in his collection as well. And he's always been a very grounded, very stable voice that I, I think really brings credibility to the subject. Uh, he and his wife, Sue, I, 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 we can't negate Sue, uh, just like I can't negate my wife, Kendra, who is a huge support and uh, assistant with my research. Uh, in bringing all this together. Uh, but they, they they do a wonderful job. And Barry Greenwood, again, I think we mentioned earlier, he has one of the largest, by far, 
historical collections of material. And I, I want to add, as we, as we have Barry Greenwood up here, uh, quite often we talk about John Greenwald, who has done incredible work with the Freedom of Information Act. Black book. But with the Black Vault, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the person that paved the way regarding FOIAs was Mr. Barry Greenwood. When the FOIA uh, Act was expanded in the late 70s, Greenwood jumped on it and immediately started requesting government documents, as did Robert Todd, who we have Robert Todd's files here as part of the collection. These were some of the pioneers with FOIAs before you actually could do it on the internet, where you actually had to type out a letter and right. mail it. And as a result, Barry has a treasure trove of original government documents, and we have a treasure trove of government documents from Robert Todd's FOIA requests here, courtesy of Jan Aldridge. But I just want to give Barry credit and also give John Greenwald credit because uh, he's doing an incredible amount of work. And I've known, I've yes. seen John, I've seen John grow up over, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years since he got involved in this. And he's just, he's someone that has really stayed with it. And, uh, you know, is another one that I would say is tenacious. Okay. Then we got Rod Dyke. Yeah. Rod Dyke. Uh, he has a huge historical archive. He actually runs, I believe the, the oldest comic book store in the world, uh, out of Seattle, Washington. That's his, his business. And, uh, he lives, uh, in the Seattle area and he has gathered together extremely rare, uh, UFO related newspapers, news clippings, government documents. As I alluded to earlier, he has the personal files and correspondence of Donald Kehoe and Richard Hall, who were really two pivotal figures in, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and so once we get a building, Rod has already committed his collection to come here to Albuquerque. And this will be another reuniting. I alluded earlier that the audio tapes he sent are now reunited with the NICAP case files that they once were with. We'll also now be able to bring Richard Hall's files and Donald Kehoe's files to the collection here. And so it's really, you could almost say it's NICAP reconstituted after many, many decades, bringing all this disparate material back together again. And again, to Tom's point, it's a tribute to Richard Hall. It's a tribute to Donald Kehoe uh, to commemorate their memory and their work on all of this. Okay, and then last but not Dr. least, Dr. Mark Rodiger. Yeah, Dr. Mark Rodiger, scientific uh, 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 chief consultant for uh, the Center for UFO Studies. He was actually the successor to Dr. J. Allen Hynek, uh, the director of the, the Center for UFO Studies, founded in 1973. Uh, Mark Rodiger really, again, brings, like, much like uh, Rob Swiatek, a very grounded scientific approach to the subject. Um, uh, they have done a tremendous amount of work. You know, I've been doing this 33 years and I feel like a freshman compared to these gentlemen, the, the amount of decades that they've spent. And truly, I, I have to say, I, I often don't say this verbally, but I'm always thinking it. I'm honored to be able to work and have these people as friends and colleagues. Can we touch on NICAD for a moment? NICAP? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon. It was now, one wasn't, of was one, wasn't that basically based, I'm sorry, in Massachusetts? Uh, D.C. actually, Washington D.C. They had their home office. Yeah, the building is no longer there. Uh, you know, due to due to expansion and construction, uh, the, unfortunately, their their facility no longer resides there. But they were actually based in D.C. and okay. they garnered a lot of serious attention. They were, I would argue, the premier organization. Mm -hmm. They they ran concurrently with APRO, the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization. But NICAP, by virtue, Tom, of being based in D.C had a lot of good political and military connections. In fact, Kehoe uh, had a lot of connections. He was a, a retired Marine officer. He had a lot of uh, uh, commercial pilots and military pilots that were feeding him information. For those that have read his early books from the 1950s, he talks a lot about this and uh, meeting uh, rather cloak and dagger some of these individuals and in hotel lobbies in DC to get inside information on what was going on. And uh, they gathered a lot of material, both uh, domestically, but internationally as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the rare recordings I just digitized was a, a meeting in the 1960s, early 1960s at NICAP headquarters, uh, Dr. Olavo Fontes, who was one of the Brazilian leading ufologists of time, actually made a visit to the United States, one, one of a few that he had made in the 60s. And he went to DC and someone had a tape recorder for that meeting I'm sure it's the only recording that probably yeah, exists. I heard about that. And we were able to digitize that and preserve that. So do you have a lot of the files on that? The um... 
some of the Brazilian we do, not a lot. Not a lot from the 1950s. A lot of that, unfortunately, resides in the APRO files, which uh, currently have been sequestered for about 30 or 40 years. We're trying to actually access the APRO files and incorporate that into the National UFO Historical Records. And wasn't there a MUFON individual part of that or came out of that or there was? Oh, well, it's funny. Yeah, no, I don't who that was. And yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, oh, you know, uh, Walt Andrus was a member of a number of different organizations, and then he eventually broke off and okay. helped uh, uh, found the, the, the Mutual UFO Network, originally the Midwest UFO Network. And uh, what's interesting is you find in these files, I say it's the NICAP KUFOS files, yeah. you'll find you'll find MUFON files in here, you'll find APRO files in here, because Tom, to your point, a lot of these uh, UFO they researchers work for multiple around. organizations, right. yeah. and there was a lot of cross-pollinization as far as data going back and forth. Yeah, one was coming up, one was going out, right? Absolutely. One lost Absolutely. funding, this one had support, this one didn't. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Interfuting, so fighting. It's, luckily, we have a lot of uh, other files besides just the official NICAP KUFOS case. Yeah, I got one more question. Can I, may I, Tim? Yeah. Please? Okay. So for those on chat, because we are running out, this is a fast hour, by the way. Um, <laughs> I love this stuff. It's grounded. Um, okay, see, I do. Seriously, that's who I am. Um, okay, so... Everybody's heard of the swamp gas crap, right? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Can we put that to bed? Can you, if you don't mind, just put a bow around that? Because it seems like, I think he said that one time, and he didn't really mean it that way. Thank and you, swamp Tom. gas is very small. Thank it you, always Tom. stays very low to the ground, and everybody, okay. I, I'm glad you're right. bringing this up. I, I, Michael, were we talking about this just er, the, earlier the other day? Yes, I can't sure. remember. The yeah. swamp gas? Oh, yeah. Uh, Tom, exactly to your point, many people fail to realize that there was a series of sightings around Dexter, Michigan, uh, near uh, uh, Hillsdale College and, uh, and, and the surrounding area as well. And uh, Heineck was sent out there because they had really uh, generated a lot of media interest, not only locally, but nationally. And so Heineck was dispatched to go look at the case. He landed at the airport and he was besieged by just a sea of media personnel, camera crews, camera snapping, people pushing microphones in his face, literally just got off the plane. And they were saying, Dr. Heineck, you know, what does Project Blue Book think? What does the Air Force feel that this might be? And he was being pressured and hammered with questions. What you don't often hear, you see the little sound bites, but like, like media in general, they often cut out certain elements. He stated... I just landed in Michigan. I haven't interviewed one witness yet. I still have yet to conduct my investigation. And they kept hounding and pressuring him. He said, well, based on some of the preliminary descriptions that I've heard, it, it could possibly be swamp gas. But he added, which is often cut out, but I haven't interviewed any of the witnesses yet. And so the media ran with it, much like they ran in 47 with Kenneth Arnold's statement saying it was the, the objects moved like uh, an object skipping across water and mm -hmm. like, they, like a saucer skipping across water. He was water. just trying to diffuse and get out of there and do his thing. Yeah, but he admitted, I, I have yet to conduct my investigation. And so swamp gas or marsh gas, you know, was the big headline. Heineck says Air Force dismisses as swamp gas. Um, I will tell you, and I've never mentioned this on an interview, but since you brought this up, Tom, I have not seen a UFO. In other words, I've never seen a structured object that I can't readily identify. I've seen very far distant lights moving in a very strange manner. I really don't say I saw a UFO. I really need to see something of more substance before I'm going to say Dave Marler saw a UFO. But that being said, I grew up in Southern Illinois, just across the river from St. Louis. I grew up directly across from a golf course that sat down in this low lying area. And it was actually my first job before I was legally able to work. I picked up uh, golf balls at the driving range. And immediately adjacent to that golf course was a swamp, cattail swamp, mosquitoes like you couldn't believe. Um, I used to watch storms roll in, from, you know, typically coming in from, from the, the north or the northwest. And I'd be watching the storms sweep across the golf course. And my bedroom window kind of looked out over this area. On one particular year, and I, I, I can't remember the exact year, I would say I was only maybe eight or nine years old. I'm watching this massive storm front sweeping across. You can just see this, this wall of rain moving towards the house. And there's a lot of lightning that's accompanying the rainstorm. Down below, I was looking at the lightning. My attention was drawn to this low-lying area where I knew there were cattails and dead vegetation. And to my surprise, I didn't know at the time. I don't know. I didn't know what I was looking at. I see 
what I called, and I even ran in the room and told my parents, I'm seeing these silent explosions. I was seeing these phosphorescent green flashes. It, and it was essentially, it, it, the only thing it could have been in retrospect was marsh gas. There were pockets of low-lying areas where all these cattails were mashed down. And it, literally, as that storm front hit that, with that static electrical discharge, it created this like chain reaction of green flashes. And the best green I can call it is if you've seen meteors, they have that kind of uh, Kelly green phosphorescent yep. look. Like that, a peridot. A peridot? Yeah, exactly. And it looked like this series of little flashes. And uh, so I always like to tell people, I really haven't seen a UFO, but I have seen swamp gas. <laughs> but they're close to the ground too, right? A couple of feet from the ground? It was directly either on the ground or in yeah. these little little pockets that I knew mm -hmm. existed down right. there. They're not too high off the ground, so they no. couldn't. No. They couldn't explain what was being reported. No, but I just like, I've never, I don't think I've ever mentioned that on an interview, Tom, but since you brought up the swamp gas, I, I have seen swamp gas. <laughs> uh, something else we need to put to rest is it's not the reflection off a of bird's back end either. Yeah. It's yeah. Bird balloons are quite often used. Although I will tell you in some of the NICAP case files, they have uh, conclusively proven some of the uh, early reports were, in fact, balloons or migratory birds, etc. One of the scariest things that I see, and I, I think your audience will agree, uh, one of the, the hobbies, if you can call it that, for young teenage, typically boys, back in the 60s, were to launch these garment bag balloons. They would take a garment bag from the dry cleaner, take string, create a little balsa wood box, and put a little tea light candle in there and it would eventually lift that balloon up and would of, often be illuminated to some degree. And that would start to fire. Exactly, Tom. <laughs> what goes up must come down. So I'm curious yeah, how many, how, how many rockets burned right? as a yeah. result of these UFO hoaxes. And we although had the SP you, rockets, yeah. Although nowadays you can tell the difference between something unknown and say a uh, Chinese lantern, because uh, when you look at it through a camera lens, Chinese lantern flickers. You, you can see it flickering. You can see the flame. Yeah, absolutely. You know, where and you we can see it moving on the wind in certain ways, you know? Where we really have issues, though, as investigators in, uh, in the subject, and I just saw one uh, just the other day, which kind of took me by surprise for all of about 10 seconds until I realized what it was, is the proliferation of drones, both, both private, commercial, and military drones that are now in our airspace. Uh, right. Some of those are very unusual looking at first glance. The thing I've always heard about drones, and you can kind of rule out the most people have to use the FAA lighting when they when when they use them at night. Uh, some people don't, but they should. And then um, a lot of drones are really noisy. Yeah, yeah. So you, uh, so you can really hear them. In but my case, the wind's blowing in the wrong. Yeah, way. I was gonna say in my case, just the other day, I saw one at a distance that didn't have characteristic lights. And it did take me by surprise for a minute. But then what I noticed was the object made a very quick, swift descent straight down. And then yeah. as, as I continued to move in that direction, then I could see a group of individuals congregating over there right where it had sat down. And we quickly surmised it was it was someone playing with a drone locally here. Right. I've, I've noticed that a lot. People will post clips where the UFO either goes straight up into the clouds or it goes straight down and you know right away it's probably a drone yeah yeah so it but, just adds uh, to the complexity of trying to investigate these cases and separating the ifos from the ufos right. that's why uh we always look for a chain of data or pro provenance Absolutely. because um like for instance when i saw my ufo encounter in chatfield minnesota in i can't even remember the year anymore 2010 i think uh, there were 12 of us that saw it. So yeah. it wasn't just my account. Right. It was six other adults and uh, six children. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how everybody reacted and how we all tried to get it. And I can tell you from what I saw, David, it was definitely not um, ours. And the way I know this is because they were rectangular in shape. They okay. had rounded corners and they were filled with a living fire. Kind of like if you can imagine hmm. um, Independence Day where the ship is breaking into our atmosphere and oh, it's on sure. fire. 
Sure. Imagine that fire in a rect the confines of a rectangle. Okay. But then six of them in a line, in a horizontal line, uh, evenly spaced. Interesting. And sitting there for 25 minutes in broad daylight. Oh, in broad daylight. Yes. Interesting. Underneath it, a thousand foot cloud cover, and it, twelve of us saw. Them. Did it uh, garner any local media attention? Did it, anything? It, yes, it, it did, but it was blown off by the local media as fireworks. <laughs> but I told them fireworks number one don't have defined shapes right. that stay there, and they don't stay there for twenty five minutes. Stationary fireworks, I love that one. That's a new yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> they blew it off. I want fifty dollars worth. <laughs> they, they they called me crazy and a lunatic, lunatic for mm -hmm. even suggesting they were UFOs. Well, I will tell you, I, I can't think of any cases specifically with locations and dates, but going through the NICAP files as I have been with the scanning project. There have been uh, rectangular objects that have been reported. And in fact, some of the triangular UFO cases that I researched, uh, rectangles were seen in conjunction with triangular UFOs. And uh, on March uh, 29th, 1989, the first uh, sighting series that really sparked or initiated the wave of sightings in Belgium uh, with the triangles, uh, that was one, uh, November 29th, I'm sorry, I said March, November 29th, 1989, uh, they described seeing these two triangles and Albert Kreutz, who was the police dispatcher, hearing the gendarmes call in the reports, thought they were just making it up or joking. And he stepped out on the balcony and looked out and he didn't see a triangle, but he saw this rectangular object with a light at each corner of the this black triangle or rectangle that slowly moved and disappeared. And I found another case in New York from the APRO files. This was published in the APRO Bulletin in the 1980s. A mother and a daughter returning home from the grocery store saw this uh, black triangle move over their neighborhood. They went in and uh, brought the groceries in, stepped back outside, and the triangle had disappeared. But then they saw this rectangular object. And in my book, I actually show side by side the sketches. They're both describing black rectangles with bl uh, bright white circular lights at each corner. Okay, one thing I was going to say is that Sighting, rash of sightings over the several counties in Illinois at one point yeah. reported by those sheriffs were actually rectangular. Yeah, uh, the vast majority were triangular with the exception of a civilian witness, Mr. Melvern Knoll, who unfortunately has since passed away. I interviewed oh. Melvern. He was the initial witness. He, he started this whole series of events. I always say he's the hero in the story. Most people focus on the police officers, but the officers probably wouldn't have seen what they saw had not Melvern seen what he had observed and quickly ran to the police station and told them, call the neighboring town because whatever I saw, it's heading in their direction. And that set a series of events in place. But he saw a bright light coming in from the northeast. And then as it slowly got closer, he realized the light was affixed to a solid object which he described as a flying house with a little penthouse on top. Right. That's and, what he said. Yep. And it moved immediately to the south of his location. He had a miniature golf course and I stood with him where he stood and it moved over this, this row of trees that, that lined the back of the miniature golf course. And he saw this thing disappear. Now he described a rectangle. The other officers described a triangular object, but then we had two other witnesses come forward later saying they saw a rectangular object in the vicinity where the triangle was seen. And so for many years, I wrestled with the fact, did in fact Melvern see a triangle that had some, some depth to it? And he simply saw it one side of the triangle. Yeah, on and an that's angle. what he reported. On an but, angle. But he was adamant that he saw it move and then turn which then afforded him to see it from the back. And he still described it as rectangular with a series of white windows with black vertical lines in the back. So based on that and based on the additional witness testimony, we do feel that there was a rectangular object and at least one triangle, possibly two in that area that night. And again, historical context. Then I find these other reports that were never well publicized that describe rectangles and triangles being seen together. Mm. I gotta say this though, uh, the one that's important to me, believe it or not, because it happened on my birthday, was March thirteenth, nineteen ninety-seven. The Phoenix Lights. Yes, 
Um, on your birthday. Now that's one hell of a birthday gift. Tim. That's that's my birthday. Yes, <laughs> March thirteenth. And um, then uh, this was one of the depictions of what the governor said he saw. Yeah. And then this was supposedly up close. Yeah. I've lectured in Phoenix a, a number of times over the years and talked to some of the witnesses and some of the researchers that investigated the case. And uh, I know a lot of people tend to discount it as flares and other types of things. But I always like to say, though, with regard to the Phoenix lights, and, and I mentioned this uh, to one of the Phoenix MUFON investigators that was talking about it. She's like, well, what's some of your comments on that case? And I gave her a few comments, not having investigated the case personally. But I said, one thing I'd like you to put in for my comments is the Phoenix Lights, terrible name to attribute to this case. I said, mm -hmm. if you want to be accurate, let's be honest. It wasn't just seen in Phoenix and it wasn't just lights. I said, if you really wanted to attribute a title to this, this case, triangle. which unfortunately the Phoenix Lights name is stuck, Phoenix it should be called the Arizona Chevron. <laughs> yeah, more like a chevron yeah. rather than a train, yeah. right? And it was seen yeah. throughout Arizona. It, it, to call it the Phoenix Lights almost belittles the nature of the case. Was that uh, Jim and um, oh, what's his wife's name? St uh, well, Stacy Wright is the Stacey, state director yeah, there, Stacey. and then Jim Mann. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, and uh, but really, I mean, to call it the Phoenix Lights belittles the case. It was a, it was a statewide sighting of not only lights but a structured object. Well, talking about your book, I want to go back to your book real quick. You've got a book that you wrote on triangles mm -hmm. called Triangular UFOs, an Estimate of the Situation, forward by John B. Alexander, Ph.D. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if people are interested in the book, it is available on Amazon for $19.95 in paperback, or you can get it for nothing on Kindle Unlimited. So check it go. out. There you go. Um, David is the foremost authority on triangular UFO sightings. So and that's what I think of you. So um, here we go. We have some stuff from the archive that David uh, sent our way. Here's one. Ah, I love finding these old newspaper accounts. It's one thing to have just one eyewitness uh, UFO report from NICAP or from KUFOS, but uh, this was a multiple witness sighting in Pennsylvania. And you can see the year there, 1957. And they described what is depicted in, in the image there. Uh, you can see uh, underlined resembling a triangle with a light at each corner and it hovered. And all of a sudden it stopped dead and started to spin. In other words, it turned, uh, it pivoted on its axis and then started to go back the way it came. And that's uh, this flat pivot turn or flat turn that these objects are often seen exhibiting but uh, the lights at each point uh, is characteristic of many of these reports, although uh, some of these triangles are completely devoid of lights. Uh, right. there, there are variations in the triangles, just like other UFO reports. Not every flying saucer report is identical, uh, right. nor are triangles. Here's another one. I love this one, uh, Tim. This, this is one I, I'd love to share because this was a, a, a mother, a, a father, and a daughter yeah, early in the morning hours that got up they saw a number of these uh, five triangular UFOs moving in the sky. And this is a scan of an actual piece of paper that you can see was paper clip. You can still see the rusted marks of the paper clip because it's been filed for decades. This was a case from 1960. They saw these, these five triangular objects moving around. And I thought this was cute because quite often we get either ink or pencil drawings from adults. This was the young daughter that actually did this with crayon and tried to depict what the objects looked like. And by the way, these were seen through binoculars, not just the naked eye. Wow. Okay, then we have this one. This is one that I put in my book and I had a copy of the newspaper. Once I received the NICAP case files, I found the original. I actually had an original copy of the newspaper from the Hartford Courant uh, from September 17th, 1960. And it talked about uh, two uh, consecutive nights of sightings by two families. Uh, so again, multiple witness. And this one exhibited characteristics that I had been finding in the other reports. There were three lights at each point, complete silent flight, slow speed, ability to hover, rapid acceleration, li literally the blink of an eye, the thing would shoot away, and sharp turns at high speed. The one that really stood out from all the other characteristics, and you see it highlighted there in red, eerie, no noise is what it says. And that was the one thing the witnesses were just, 
amazed with the fact that this thing was large. It was uh, hovering. It, it could shoot off in the blink of an eye and return, had these lights, and yet there was complete absence of sound. And the, the first few words there at the top, new saucer twist, flying triangle seen in state. People say the, the triangles are new as of the 1980s. Here in September of 1960, they're saying it's a new saucer twist. No more flying saucers. Now we're seeing flying triangles. Yeah. I find that interesting because I know where Westbrook is, and I used oh, to live. Beautiful. Yeah, I used to live in Hartford, and Glass I'm from Glastonbury, Connecticut, in some respects. Excellent. Yeah, and so that was September 2nd, and our incident in Massachusetts, about maybe an hour away, was September 1st. First, you said, right? 1969. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Now, here's one, uh, Baltimore. And again, I was really amazed not only to find these historic triangle cases, but to find these uh, that many of these were seen through telescopes or binoculars. And there you can see obtained a pair of eight by 50 binoculars. And as they did, uh, the binoculars showed it to be a triangle, uppercase letters at each corner, bright, steady white light, not, flack and not, not flashing or flickering like FAA aviation lights. In the middle of the object and beneath it was a small red light. There was, and you can see there, uppercase letters, there was no sound whatsoever. And it was flying about 100 to 225 miles per hour, no more. And the commentary at the very end of the report I thought was funny. Now, remember, this is 1964. The witness noted, I'm keeping an eye out for further Delta machine information as I'm still astonished at how it flew so slow and without a sound and being so large. And of course, those are characteristics we hear with regard to the modern or contemporary triangle sightings. This one's interesting. Uh, I love this sketch. Uh, this was a black and white sketch and I colored it in based on the description that they gave. But rather than having lights at each point or along the sides, this entire underside of this triangular shaped object was illuminated with red panels, bright red panels. And this one uh, was triangle shaped as it says, and it also says that the object was only about 450 feet up in the sky. So again, very low altitude flight as many of these triangles are shown. And this was Texas, 1965. Wow. And you know what? That's kind of reminiscent of the 1969 incident with the panels, Tim. You've got to where it put out a reddish tint and it had like panels throughout it. It almost looked like a snake skin or a turtle right. shell. On your turtle sauce. Shell, would, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we definitely need to exchange some information, Tom. <laughs> and this is another example uh, of the colored or glowing underside when they're either not completely absent of light or they don't have the individual lights. This is from Louisville, Kentucky. This is the original witness sketch that we have in the files. And you can see that they're describing this illuminated orange glowing triangle. And in the sketch and in the written narrative, typewritten narrative we have on this case, you see the object moving north to south, but then it makes this acute flat turn and then starts to move off to the west. Uh, and, and none of these triangles that I have exhibit a, a wide turn radius like jet aircraft that we would see at an air show. These right. things can literally turn on a dime. Here's a, a very reminiscent uh, triangular image that we might see from contemporary reports. Fresno, California. Again, this is 1966. And unfortunately, in this case, no exact date. Like many of these reports that we often come across, it, it may have been filed a year or two after the event. And they say, well, I can't remember. I think it was August or September. And I think it was on a Saturday. But unfortunately, in this one, we don't have the exact date. But you can see what the witness wrote. Uh, moved slowly over city, back and forth, went up and down speeded and slowed, moved very slowly when being over me, and it almost stopped. And again, uh, we have this large dark object, and uh, this one was actually smaller. You can see the length is only 25 feet and the width 20 feet. Most of the reports are of these very large triangles, but we do have reports of smaller triangles. And of course, the uh, Bentwaters UFO incident, they described a roughly triangular type shaped object that was relatively small. Uh, but this is unique because uh, some of these objects aren't silent. They do have sounds. And that one described a whining sound, a low droning whining sound. Some of them describe them as a, like a transformer. And in fact, Tim, you mentioned the uh, Southern Illinois case that I investigated. Right. Uh, Officer Craig Stevens of Millstadt described a low decibel buzzing sound, very similar or reminiscent to a electrical transformer sound. And of course, we don't have triangles just restricted to the United States. Here's British Columbia. They had a series of sightings. Uh, this was March 25th, 66. 
And you can see there, one woman reports seeing two triangular objects. Again, many of these triangular reports often show two or more triangles being seen. And of course, you see the characteristics there, low altitude flight. This These objects could hover completely silent with, again, rapid acceleration when they disappeared. Here's New Hampshire, uh, early, mid-October. Again, unfortunately, no exact date. And I just wanted to show you the handwritten uh, uh, fields that they, they, they filled in there. Definitely triangular shaped. It just looked black. And as far as did the objects uh, rise or fall, no. Just cruise slowly like a very slow moving aircraft. And then what any sound, uh, what kind? And it said there, uh, a motor idling softly, almost a hum. And again, you know, a humming sound very similar to an electrical transformer. And they described a red, green, and yellow light on these. And here's uh, yet another color sketch. Uh, this one's from Virginia, 1967. Again, silent flight, a uh, very uh, characteristic uh, aspect to some of these. This one is interesting because it bears parallels to other triangle reports that I have, including the uh, November 29th, 1989 sighting in Belgium that I alluded to earlier. As you can see here, did the object drop anything? And the witness states in the article that an object, uh, something seemed to leave the object and then return back to it. And I hate to use the trite term mothership, but I don't know what other term to use. But some of these things almost seem to serve as a mothership with lights or physical objects being detached. This is one I just came across two weeks ago. Uh, I just added this one to my data set uh, in Michigan 67. And again, we have the newspaper that backs up multiple witnesses that had observed this. Uh, 75 to 100 feet, uh, feet long, shaped like the letter V. And it had this reported characteristic lighting configuration. And they described it as being kind of a silvery gray with a bright white at the leading edge of the object. And this one we had very little details on, but I wanted to include it just because it's very characteristic of the dark black triangular objects, Maryland. And again, no exact date, unfortunately, just mid late August is, is the closest they could pin it down. Uh, this was at 9.30 p.m., but uh, you can see uh, a bank of orange lights and a bank of red lights that was described. Ah, this one's very interesting. I'm glad we have this in, in, in the deck. This one was sighted just outside of Scott Air Force Base, approximately a mile from there near the town of Shiloh. Now, if that, that town sounds familiar, that's where Officer uh, uh, David Martin saw a very similar triangular-shaped object on the famous January 5th, 2000 Southern Illinois incident. This is a collection that uh, we were talking about earlier. Uh, and Tom, we were talking about MUFON. Uh, Walt Andrus and a number yeah. of others formed MUFON. And many of the members were uh, former members or existing members of the UFO study group of Greater St. Louis. It was actually a precursor to MUFON. I, in 2005, I inherited their case file collection and historical data. Going through the various reports and papers that were in complete disarray, I came across that sighting report. And you can imagine my shock when I saw that sketch on the front of the, the object. But again, I was even uh, more shocked when I found out that that location was within a, a mile to half mile of where Dave Martin saw his triangle on January 5th, 32 years later. So is it safe to say you like the older cases more so than the newer ones, or is it just a way to uh, kind of uh, have a foundation to, to, to build I on? Think, I, think, I think the latter, Tom. I think just having a foundation. But admittedly, I, as we go back in time and look at these historic cases, and, and I've had many people put forth this argument, and I can't disagree with it. How do you know the object that those officers saw on January 5th, 2000 wasn't a military aircraft? And in 2000, when it occurred... I didn't. Well, because not, they've been seen for 30 years prior to that. Well, and, right. but I didn't know that at the time. I didn't have this case file at the time. No, everybody point. thinks that was like an 80s thing, like the exactly. Hudson River Valley had uh, triangle sightings. But right? for, for sightings that have occurred, and one could use this argument about any UFO sighting, not just triangles, for sightings that, say, occurred in the last, say, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, you know, you might say, well, it could have been military. And I would argue probably really just 10 or in the last 10 or 20 years. It could have been military, but when we start going back 30, 40, 50, 60 years, I would argue, and I would put this forth to your audience, I think we can say with a fair degree of certainty, we know what state-of-the-art aviation technology was back then. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. We certainly didn't have flying 
you know, <laughs> V-shaped crafts hovering over his cities in 1957. Well, exactly, Tom. And, and this is another one I just came across uh, two weeks ago doing my scanning project, uh, one that I had missed in my initial review of the case files. And uh, this one I thought was interesting. They described it as like a dark blue and it had a dark black rim around it, but there was this line of white illuminated light around the entire craft. And then it had these three red lights that ran down the middle. And this was in uh, 1967, Pennsylvania. Wow. I think I missed this one. Oh, New Orleans. Yes, this is another one. I just, I think this one just last weekend I, I stumbled across. Uh, this is from 1967. And uh, you can see, I love this one because it doesn't only depict the UFO, it depicts the witness standing there, the little stick figure. And uh, they describe a, a, a bank of black rectangular, almost reflective. They said it was almost like tinted glass, like, like black tinted glass that ran along the two sides of this triangle. This one's really a unique case from New York, 1968. And again, we have the NICAP report form with the sketches from the witness. We also have, as you can see there, a contemporaneous newspaper account, report seeing flying triangle outlined by lights. I, I love when I can find these news, news accounts from the time period that, that talk about flying triangles. Um, this one, as you can see, all the characteristics there. One characteristic I don't think we've talked about yet in looking at these cases, many of these triangles, unlike conventional wisdom, where we think of a triangular, say, aircraft with the point as the leading edge, Many of these triangles have the flat side as a leading edge. In other words, it almost looks like they're moving in reverse, contrary to conventional wisdom. Um, this witness was driving along the highway, and you can see his little car depicted there in the sketch. Before he arrived at the location you see there, he had seen a red light, a red orb, zip across the sky or uh, the road in front of him, uh, and he continued to drive along. As he continued to drive just about a half mile further down the road, he looks over to the right and sees this illuminated triangular object. And initially it was up over a ridge line above some trees, but then you can see the object drops down into a ravine and he's watching this, his vehicle slows down and he sees the triangle go into this ravine. And he was literally able to look down and see this hovering triangle sitting in this ravine, which is very rare. We don't often have, witnesses afforded the pleasure of seeing a triangle from above. And then he eventually took off and left the area. But uh, this is one where we have the, the flat side is the leading edge and we see it dropping down very low into this uh, valley or ravine. Very cool. Here's uh, one for people that say, well, you know, we never saw these triangles uh, before. This looks just like reports from the 80s or contemporary reports. This was a witness in Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, he, he talked about the fact that this object was completely silent. And in the report, which you don't see here, he stated, and I do have normal hearing. He made a, a special point to put that in his report. Uh, he, they originally looked like three lights when it was approaching and when it was receding, but when it was directly overhead, this is what he described. It was a silvery, metallic gray in color and these very bright yellow lights that were seen at each point. That's kind of different because you don't hear a lot of reports like that. Uh, in what respect? Uh, silvery gray with uh, orange lights at the corners. Right. Uh, you hear a lot of black ones with the white lights. At the corners. Correct. So yeah. Not yellow so much. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Except well, the child's drawing had yellow. Yes, right, that's, that's true. true. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this one is really fascinating. This is Mr. Earl Neff. He was a legend in Cleveland ufology. In fact, he was part of the Cleveland Ufology Project, which is still around. I had the pleasure of uh, lecturing in Ohio in August of last year, and I think some members from the group were there. But he belonged to the Cleveland Ufology Project, or CUP, uh, you know, to go with your flying saucer. Uh, and he was driving back, ironically enough, from a local UFO meeting with two or three other individuals. And they described seeing this triangular object illuminated with red and green lights down one side. It was gray in color. And uh, I, I mentioned that because Earl Neff was held in very high regard. He did a lot of local radio and uh, uh, TV shows. And he was regarded as a very well-grounded expert. And I think he was well-respected by many of his peers in, in the UFO research field at the time. But as you can see, bottom right, the sketch there, you see the arrow depicting the direction of movement. 
We also have sketches in the case file, NICAP's case file, of the other witnesses. They describe the same triangular object uh, with that blunt end forward movement. The flat side of the triangle was the leading edge. And again, the object was completely silent. Zilla, Washington, 1970. This is one, as I alluded to earlier, many of these witnesses not only saw these objects with the naked eye, but with binoculars and telescopes. This is one where the individual actually had the uh, an aid in seeing the object. And when he really zoomed in with binoculars, you could see initially a triangular object, but when he zoomed in the bottom right there, this was his sketch of what he observed through the binoculars. It was a uh, dark gray triangle with this, these rows or banks of white lights and two small red lights in the back end of the object. And you can see it just kind of moved along uh, until it eventually disappeared out of view. And as we're now in 1970s, here's one from 1974. Uh, this was one, and you can see there, to J. Allen Hynek. This was a, a typed letter by the witness, and we have many of those that were sent to Hynek due to his publicity on radio and TV uh, and in the newspaper. Many people were sending reports in to him, and this is just one year after the, the uh, Center for UFO Studies was, was created. Uh, this individual described this triangle with blue, green, and red lights with a white light in the center, and again, completely silent flight, and that was in Illinois in 1974. And then in Idaho, we have this case, uh, the night of May 10th into the morning of May 11th, 1975. And again, multiple triangular UFOs were observed by this witness. And uh, it, on the second column there, you can see we got out a pair of field glasses to look at the thing. So again, I was really amazed how many uh, aided eye reports we had, not just eyewitnesses uh, with the naked eye. And you can see it was a triangle with lights on it and a dark blue patch at one end. It looked like it was moving up and down. And it, again, a small article, uh, but I thought it was interesting. Women observe flying triangle. And this is 1975 in Illinois, Villa Park. And they described uh, the triangle measuring 30 feet by 40 feet and about 50 feet above their car. And so again, one of the smaller reports. Here's one that really garnered a lot of media attention, as you can see as evidenced by the front page of the Memphis Press Scimitar here. Uh, multiple police officers observed this object and we talked a number of times about the Southern Illinois case I investigated with police officers. This is very reminiscent in the sense that we had multiple police officers from different squads and tactical squads in and around Memphis seeing this triangle at different times from different vantage points. All of them, much like the Southern Illinois case, were in radio contact with one another. And again, the characteristics, ability to hover, low altitude flight, silent flight, large size, rapid acceleration, literally the blink of an eye. One officer saw it, it streaked away. He's in radio contact. An officer that was about 10 miles distant said, yeah, I see it now. So it, these things have the ability to, to really traverse a large amount of uh, space in a very short amount of time. And yet one of the interesting aspects we see with this and other UFO reports with the complete absence of a sonic boom. Right, and usually most of them are traveling quite slow. So when they take off, it's, it's, a, it's a shock to most observers. It is. It is. And again, with complete absence of sound, it, whether jet engine sound or a sonic boom. And in the case of Southern Illinois, the object did a rapid acceleration. We knew the location of the two officers. We had the timestamps on the radio dispatch recordings. We knew the times. We knew the distances. We knew the speed calculated roughly. And this thing clearly exceeded the sound barrier when it made that acceleration. Wow. Awesome. Here was an interesting series of sightings, and this is again uh, in the New Hampshire area, and it was in two areas there on August 26th and uh, October 20th of 1978, and these were uh, different uh, witness sketches of this triangular object. Admittedly, you will get variations in some of the eyewitness sketches, but uh, again, very reminiscent of modern day reports, but this was 1978. And the last one we have. This is one I just discovered last weekend, actually. And I it's a fairly detailed case file, which I still have to review in detail. Uh, but I did just add it because it had a very interesting sketch there. Uh, it was two triangles that were almost flying in tandem with one another, one almost rightly uh, directly above the other. And you can see there, my daughter uh, went out and looked at the object, and it was two triangular objects. And uh, quite often, again, as I mentioned earlier, we see that these things often travel in pairs. And I would argue some of the solitary triangle reports, uh, seeing that there is apparently a pattern here with these things flying in pairs, 
how many reports that we have of triangles might have involved two, but admittedly, myself included, if I see a huge black triangle, I'm going to be transfixed looking at it. My, my first thought is not, let me look around to see if there's any others. So how many of these solitary triangles may have actually had a wingman? Or how many of them were actually overlaid one on top of the other? Exactly. Uh, so when, when like you that. saw, yeah. So when you saw a five-story triangle, maybe it was two of them or three of them. Well, now, we have a case from Blue Book Files. To your point, Tim, uh, a, a pilot was flying solo all over Albany, Georgia, and this was tracked, by the way, uh, on radar by the Albany, Georgia airport in the Blue Book file. And I have an original case files from Heineck on this case. And the pilot saw a light that was changing orange, white, orange, white. And he decided to descend towards the object. When he did, the Blue Book report, based on the pilot's own testimony, states the object turned into a red triangle. And then he proceeds to state, as if that's not strange enough, the object then subdivided into two red triangles, which then disappeared. Okay, I have to say this before I allude, uh, or before I go over to my co-host. Um, I have a friend, his name is Anthony. He runs a channel on YouTube called Unidentified S4. Okay. His significant sighting was of a low-flying black triangle that came over his head, and then all of a sudden it split into two. There were there was one overlaying the other one. Okay. And the the one that came off the top went to the side and started going around the the one in the middle in a circle. Okay. So um, I'm going to give you that information of how you can contact him so he can give you the information on that. Yeah, I would love to cross-reference that with some of these other cases. I think that would be really important. That would be fantastic. I appreciate that, Tim. Yeah, I'll send you his information and you can talk to him. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Tom, did you have something? Uh, yeah. Um, Tim, do you have our old 1967 news article from our family in Sheffield, Mass? I couldn't find it, Tom, but did you have? did you send it to me? Recently, you showed it before. Yeah, you you should have it. Uh, I don't know how, how many times I have to send you the same thing. It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I have like I know, but it's a rare freaking four thousand. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I, um, there are so many things that uh, you touched on. You know, from the reddish tent to this almost looking like a um, like a tic tac toe board or something, right. or right, you know, checker type thing and um yeah i would like to talk to you the further and, absolutely um, yeah i mean we know we're running kind of late today but um there's well you know time well spent for sure so no absolutely and i love talking talking about the cases because quite often and I, I mean no disrespect to the people in the field a lot of people like to speculate a lot of people like to pontificate i like to just recite i like to share right. the raw reports and the raw data with with audiences such as yours and again, yeah. I, I, I leave it up to your audience to decide what to make of these reports. Right. And, and, you know, I always say there's three sides to the triangle. And I think there's three potential explanations for many of these triangle reports. Uh, one, the most logical is, and again, maybe in more, more recent years, some of these could be military. I don't know what state right. of the art technology is. So I'll be right. the first to say, at, at least as it relates to more modern or contemporary reports, some of these could be military that people are seeing. But right. when you go back in time, I think we have to be intellectually honest with ourselves and say, did we have such technologies in the 1950s and 60s? And isn't it interesting? We're still seeing these things reported today. So yeah, we're still we're, we're still building <laughs> building F-18 super and right? aerospace just to lift trees and stuff. I mean, it's, exactly. We're still exactly. using helicopters. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so. You know, could it be military? Some of these, yes. Could it be extraterrestrial or God knows what? Yes. The answer might lie somewhere in the middle, and that's the third side of the triangle. Or well, we don't really have anything that can hover either silently and then move away quickly. I mean, we use thrust. We have the uh, rotating engines on the sides of some planes. Absolutely. We've got, you know, mostly it's it's propeller or thrust. Well, I talked to Dr. Allen over in the UK who helped develop the uh, Harrier jump jet. And right. uh, it's in it's in my book, but I had a lengthy interview with him. And I was describing some of these triangles. And he said, well, if it was hovering, it could have been uh, one of my, as he said, one of my Harriers. He, he takes a lot of pride in just helping design that. And he goes, uh, where was the witness? I said, directly underneath the, the individual. And he goes, well, what sound? I said, there was no sound. He goes, well, that doesn't sound like one of my Harriers. <laughs> 
Yeah, so there are a lot of things out there unexplainable, and we're aware of that, I guess. Tom wanted me to bring up a couple things that he found before the show, so here's yeah. one of them. Large triangle hovers outside witness's window, and I don't know if that's a drawing or whatever it is, but it's a MUFON case. Absolutely. And if you notice there, they say it was totally black with no lights. Remember, I alluded earlier that some right. of these are completely devoid of lights. In fact, some of the witnesses <laughs> stated in those cases, if the, it wasn't a full moon or if there wasn't a moon at, at, visible that night, I wouldn't have seen it because I literally could see a dark triangle moving through the, the dark blue night sky. And blocking, blocking out, out the, the stars. stars. Yeah. Okay, then Tom found this picture. Oh, yeah. That's taken from the Unsolved Mysteries episode on the Hudson Valley Way that occurred from 83 to 86, but admittedly, Arc sightings continued after right. that. And Which our case, where, actually, our case actually went in support of that at the United Nations. Amazing. Yeah, that's an amazing series of sightings. And in fact, uh, I, I'll give a shout, shout out to a gentleman by the name of Mark. Uh, when my book came out, uh, I touched on the Hudson Valley Wave uh, as just a general piece of the overall history. Mark D'Antonio? Uh, no, no. This is a gentleman that's not widely known. I don't want to use his last name because I don't know if you'd want me to throw his, his, his last name out there. But his name was Mark. And he said, David, he goes, I stumbled across your book. And he goes, it's really amazing. You're, you're taking all of these triangles, the subset and focusing on them. He goes, I was one of the investigators during the Hudson Valley wave. I still have all my investigator notes. I'd like to send those to you. And he was very kind in sending me a one inch binder full of material that I didn't have up to that point. I, I want to thank him again for, for sharing that material. I used to speak with an Ellen Crystal who yes. was studying the Pine Bush area. Pine Bush, and, absolutely. And uh, she had a lot of information about the manta ray uh, yes. shaped craft. I remember reading her seen. book, actually. Yeah, same here. And I have her book. I wrote her a letter and she answered me. And this is back in the day of no internet. Right. And, uh, she answered me. So, um, I was asking her about the aliens on the ground picture that she had. I remember that. Which is very impressive. That's the one that, if I remember, uh, Tim had like sparks or it almost looked yes. like sparks in the yeah, photo. Yeah, it, it kind of looked like... Um, they were backlit? Like capital L's, you know, walk, walking in the... Yeah, they exactly. were backlit, kind of orangish. I remember Against that. like a big bubble that was over them. I remember really that, yeah. Cool. But Tom mentioned another famous sighting that I'm going to bring up because I agree with him. It's a substantial sighting, and it is a significant photo. So here it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. That was a famous photo taken at the time, if I recall. Right, Tom? Yeah, I think uh, that was uh, the Hudson. Yeah. That was one that actually, uh, if I remember, was even uh, played on local news. Uh, that, that got quite a bit of media coverage. Yeah. As I you know, the, the Hudson is only about uh, maybe 40 minutes from our our incident, uh, which mm -hmm. was part of the Housatonic River. Ah. And back at the in the day, because the Housatonic River was one of the most polluted waterways in America, there was some uh, talk about, well, maybe it's because of the uh, toxins and that kind of thing, because now we've got corn in the area that grows 15 to 17 feet tall. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. There's pictures of it all over the place. Yeah. So yeah, who knows? So, uh, but I'll, I'll reach out to you later. We'll talk about that. Absolutely. Well, I, I think know. all of this just demonstrates that again, what we are talking about is just the rich, diverse history of the subject and the amount of data that we have in the, in the, in the form of eyewitness testimony and case material. Yeah, you can't fit all this in in an hour and a half. So. Not at all. I'm, I'm actually curious what Mike is working on behind me because he seems like he's, he's been, been working broke. his tail off back there. He's been working his he's tail off a couple of times, but he's been so noisy back there. I can barely hear anything. <laughs> I, uh, come on over, Mike. Just, you want to join us? Sure. Yeah, say hello. I think I see him going through the original Socorro case file, which oh, has okay. some really tantalizing bits of information. Yeah, before I come over there, let me uh, let me grab a couple of things and I'll bring sure. them over. This, this will, this will make for some okay, while you're doing that, I'm going to do this. Um, I have to uh, give a little bit of patronage to my sponsor. Absolutely.
Short and sweet. <laughs> you know that's gotten fifty five thousand views in like a amazing. week. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. What? It's not bad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> More well, than I like, thought it would. That's for sure. Yeah. It looks like Micah has something in his hands here. And oh. I love the fact that we have this schedule while Micah's is here because quite often. I do describe that we do have visiting researchers, and I'm not lying. I really have this guy from North Carolina who came wow, out. Wow, that's so far from me. Yeah, I'm in Tennessee. I couldn't ask for a better example of a visiting researcher uh, joining David Marler in this fascinating environment right here, the National UFO Historical Records Center, <laughs> and glad to be here. Uh, in Hard to hear you. Yeah. So here's the thing. You know, David and I today drove to Socorro. Mm -hmm. The site of the famous, uh, you know, landing back in 1964, observed by police officer Lonnie Zamora. Uh, I would right. say that in, in many ways, little has changed about that little town. I mean, it's it's still very slow, very just you know, quiet, quiet, beautiful. We had we were blessed with blue sky, you know, very few clouds, uh, favorable temperatures. But we're there, and, and and we get close enough to look down into the arroyo where the thing landed, and you know that was just such an experience. But I'm over here going through documentation about NICAP researchers who were investigating Ray Stanford, of course, uh, Richard Hall, who I guess was the uh, second in command under mm -hmm. Donald Kehoe at that yes. time. Yes. And some of these incredible correspondences talking about historical records related to one of the most important cases of all time. The other one, actually, you know, that's the second batch I'm going through during the course of this conversation. I've also been going through the Delphos case from 1971 oh. in Kansas. Okay. And the continuity between them, of course, you know, these physical landing trace physical, cases. Physical trace cases. Yeah. So, so again, I mean, the, the wealth of historical data that we have here right now, this is, this is incredible, but check this out. Uh, tangent to all that, here we have, I want to hold this up. You don't mind if I hold no, this up? No, not at all. So we've, we've got a document right here, June 25th, 1964, air mail, uh, addressed to Ray Stanford, uh, who was one of the NICAP field researchers on the ground at the time, of course, mm -hmm. at Socorro. And, and I'll just briefly say as a preface to this, you know, I leave out personalities and conjectures and, and attitudes and opinions and things. Right now, what we're looking at are the, the correspondences and things that turn up between researchers, all of these people, somewhat legendary characters in the in the history of this topic. Mm -hmm. so hey, here, Tim, while he's, while he's talking about this, can can he hold that up so you can put it on a single frame so we can actually see it? Yeah, yeah hold Would it up mind? again, I'll make you large. Yeah, <laughs> I'll hold this up, and then I'm going to reference something here, actually. Well, you know what oh, we can do? There yeah. we go. Okay, there we go. So. There we go. Once the, the light. Okay, uh, there you go. Oh, now beautiful. Now beautiful. Now so you can see this old typed document, right? The two of them. June 25th, 64, now, I think is the date on it. Yep, that's correct. Now, this is uh, this is uh, Richard Hall writing to Ray Stanford, and there's something really interesting here I want to reference on the final um, paragraph, and then that spills over onto the second page. But listen to this. Uh, so Hall's talking about how he had gone and he had spoken to a gentleman at Goddard Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. This man impressed me very highly as to his honesty and integrity. I feel absolutely certain that he would do a thorough job on the Socorro sample. They were talking about the possibility of having a stone that Stanford had uh, collected from the site being analyzed because Stanford had detected, you know, minute metallic traces allegedly where it had scraped, it scraped landed. Yeah. This landing gear on this craft. Um, Hall goes on to say, and if it turned out to be strange in any way, he would frankly admit it and do something about it. We chatted about UFOs in general and physical evidence in particular for over an hour. Again, this is a guy from Goddard Space hmm. Flight Center. And this, by the way, this portion is not related to the Socorro landing. Just listen to what happens next, though. <laughs> so he says, uh, and he admitted having one artifact which puzzled him considerably at first. Now, he thought he was onto something important, but finally was able to identify... Uh, and as some new or it, I guess that's a typo. And that's the yeah. beautiful thing in some of these, like uh, <laughs> these documents, you'll see the typos, the, you know, mark outs in the case of the, the blue book files that Heineck would go through with his red felt tip mm -hmm. pen. You know, you I see Heineck and just, it's incredible to see this stuff. So anyway, uh, this gentleman identified this as some new alloy first produced about 1957 or 1958. However, there's a catch to the story. Mm -hmm. now, now, seemingly we would say, okay, well, there's this, sample. It seemed like something really extraordinary. This NASA analyst was baffled up to this point, and then he realizes, oh, okay, this is from the 1950s, and so it's not anything unusual. 
but Richard Hall notes there's a catch. The sample came about third hand from some prospector, and none of his story is documented. The sample was first in hand well after the date of production, but according to his unverified story, this prospector mm -hmm. said, it was first obtained by the prospector at the site of a UFO landing in the late 1940s. Too bad his story is so indirect and unverified, but what was being implied by this NASA analyst was that this guy said he had some sort of an alloy that was dated to the 50s, but had obtained it in the 40s. 40s. So it was technology, what, about 10 years ahead of what we had at that time and something that was left uh, as a purported landing trace evidence at a UFO landing. So that kind of stuff turns up. Now, that, there may be nothing to that, but that is a, a feature that we see in a lot of these kind of cases where the technology seems to be a few steps ahead of us, but not necessarily hundreds of years necessarily in advance of our technology. And just as these files can be uh, educational and illuminating, they can also be equally frustrating because quite often, as the example Micah showed there, you'll see in a report them reference another citing report, and then they say, go to this source or see file, and you go to the file and it's not in there. Yeah, or, right. or or they don't even provide you a lead to follow up on it. So sometimes you reach these, these intellectual cul-de-sacs where you just run into a dead end and you're like, I really want to get more information on that case, but you can't really connect the dots. Or perhaps you even find the information, but there's no reference material. So absolutely, you're you know, So trying to verify it, cross-reference it, good luck. But we are successful in many cases, though, in doing that. Yeah, and broader. I mean, that that being a tangent that showed up, that was just a little interesting breadcrumb. But I mean, these correspondences give a lot of contextual uh, information about the investigation and the dialogue behind the the front-facing investigation that gets published in books like Stanford's books, you know, the official NICAP reports that are published about this, even the Blue Book files about Socorro. And the cool thing is, is there's tremendous data about that case that the general public has not had access to or seen. And so, uh, and, and I got to note, note this as well, as David and I drive down there today, he says, let's just take all the files. And so he puts in this beautiful like leather briefcase, all of these, I mean, this stack of files and we bring all that stuff down there with us. And we're killing time down there, just down the hill from the landing site. And we're going over some of the files, standing there and reading these. And I'm thinking, man, you know, we brought history to the side of the history. Yeah, I, I, I remarked. I said, in all these decades, I said, these files resided in Chicago and in D.C. I don't think these files have ever physically been on site at the actual location. Yeah, that, that's something I wanted to ask you. Do you think that back in the day that the more significant or substantially profound cases were buried more so than those that they might have thought were or, um, something more conventional? Possibly. I don't know. There, there, there's a lot that... Uh... Well, there, yeah, so, so there's that one case you and I were looking for, and uh, there, there's the Blue Book card where the primary wow. case is listed. This, yes. was, this was a case, we were, we were looking for uh, the documentation and intelligence analysis related to a 1953 uh, incident involving a Navy aircraft over the Sea of Japan. Okay. And, and uh, the, the Blue Book uh, entry that we had was for, I think, March, uh, I believe it was March 15th, or somewhere thereabouts. Yeah. We're you know, just going off of memory here, but March 15th, I believe, 1953, uh, and then they have a supplemental reference to an in incident that occurred exactly one month later to the day on April 15th. To the day. Uh, yeah. But but now to your question there, Tom, uh, what's interesting is that researcher Brad Sparks had dug into this case. Not Obviously, what had flagged his attention, and this is something that's a running interest of mine in these early UAP cases, even up to more recent times, mm -hmm. when UAP uh, seemed to be capable of doing one of two things. Uh, when the unknown object shows up, and uh, what's known as an IFF, identification friend or foe, uh, it, transponder ping is queried. They, they essentially query uh, the aircraft to see if it is operating on a encrypted communications uh, relay that is going to we send back information stating, okay, yeah, we're friendly, right, IFF. Um, UAP in some instances over the years have done this. They have responded in the affirmative, friendly which is really weird. And it says on the Blue Book card entry uh, th that this one had been an IFF case where the anomalous pheno uh, aircraft or phenomena, when queried, responded in the affirmative, friendly. 
Yeah. Which means one of two things. Either it is one of our aircraft or is Brad Sparks, uh, Larry Hancock of the SCU and a few others have speculated. And it is a worthwhile speculation in this instance. I mean, Absolutely. there could be some technology that's capable of uh, decrypting or encrypted communications and, and sending and language back. and language. And language, well, yeah, in interpreting and understanding our language, mm -hmm. and, and it's capable of responding as though it were a known craft, right? Right. So, so this. Case However, the cool thing about that is he did. They did. If it was off-world, let's say, they made it clear that there is no problem here. We're just exactly. occupying some space. It's right almost like, it's almost like camouflage. If if we were to propose that's what's happening, it's like camouflage. They blend in. Well, nothing to see here. Move along, right? <laughs> you know, where or the or it is some sort of aircraft of ours, which opens a whole nother kettle of fish in terms of well, then whose aircraft and what kind of aircraft? This was what have? year? This was what year? Nineteen fifty-three. But again, more fundamental to your question about you know information that may be kept off the books, right? Uh, as, as researcher Brad Sparks has noted, there was an intelligence analysis that surely should not have been included in the original file batch. We were trying to find copies of that, and they, they may be somewhere. Maybe here, but we've got so much to dig through. But as he said, this surely uh, would, would have been a classified assessment at the time. But it's describing sure because it's an occupant. Well, first of all, there's obviously a sign of intelligence. They, they, didn't, they didn't see the intelligence, but there was obviously a sign of intelligence that responds in the affirmative. Absolutely. But more importantly, as the description of the case uh, was unfurled by Sparks, uh, he describes this as an agile, belligerent um, display of hostility, where these craft are essentially kind of flying it and taking these kind of dives at this Navy aircraft for like close to an hour. And he says, this overturns everything we think we know about this subject because these things were being um, aggressive and, and showing aggressive postures for uh, a, an extended period. So that information, uh, he speculated, probably wasn't intended for public consumption. And we tried to dig into that case a little even just this weekend. So again, yeah, that information, if that wasn't intended for the public to see, uh, is there more like that that indicates possible motives, possible aggression, possible communication by the UAP? These are really interesting questions to me. It's interesting questions, and I'm glad Micah brings this up because quite often we hear about radar. And I always like to say I would not spend any time looking at UFOs if it was just people saying they saw things. If it were not for the fact we have objective measures that are also detecting these things, IFF would fall into that category. Oh, certainly. Yeah, we always take for granted that radar is the only system that we have. I mean, way back before we had the AFLIR targeting pod, phased array radar like the Naval Fleet began using in the early 2000s. Or the which, Aegis. <laughs> the Aegis, you know, yeah, Spy One Bravo, all this sort of stuff. You know, helmet cams that we have nowadays, you know, that are advanced fighter pilots in their aircraft, you know, FA-18 Super Hornets that they were wearing. Back in the day, I mean, we in addition to radar, we also had IFF mm -hmm. and other things, too. Uh, and, and I think it's very important to take into consideration that there are classic cases, you know, the Minot Air Force Base incident back in the late 1960s, where in addition to there being radar traces, there were also radar scope images yeah. of the object where on the radar scope, a point of light is actually observed. Keep in mind, folks at home, that Blue Book determined this was, you know, ground-based observers seeing, I think, the planet Venus or Jupiter. <laughs> and then the pilots had been seeing a rare natural plasma, not uh, not actually swamp gas in this case, but, <laughs> but ball lightning. And they said, that's what was detected on radar. And I'm thinking, well, what, and, you know, actually, you said earlier today, what about when they flew over and saw the object? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Did and you? and radar imagery. We, uh, we were just looking at the microfilms that we have here, courtesy of Jan Aldridge. And we have all of the Blue Book microfilm radar images uh, yeah. on file here as well. And really quickly, describe the object that they saw during the Mina incident, remember? Very bizarre object. You had this, uh, I believe it was roughly circular object, but it had this protrusion or neck, if you will, and then this, this circular head. And then in front of that was this almost crescent shaped, yeah. illuminated, green phosphorescent illuminated, yeah. uh, as I think they even referenced, I think with the one military pilot said it was almost like the control, the control he center, what he thought. Yeah, and he said it, it reminded one. Well, it may have been another that said this, but they said it reminded them of a bumper. Yeah, on on the exterior. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that really sounds like ball of lightning, doesn't it? You got pump gas. Yeah, exactly. You got, you got the picture of our craft. You got a picture of the craft that we saw, which could look like a bumper. Do you have that? Your disc? No, I don't have it pulled up right now. 
I will note that there are there are similar descriptions of aircraft like that, like what David described. But again, the point being, um, when you go back and look at the historical records on this, you know, currently the efforts by the Aldermain Anomaly Resolution Office within the DoD, and even if you extend this back to you know several years ago with OSAP and ATIP and all of this, uh, you know, there are sincere efforts to try and evaluate ongoing instances of personnel, military personnel within the United States Armed Forces. Uh, encountering anomalous aerial phenomena and some extend that also to space and also to water, the so-called transmedium or all domain mm -hmm. uh, phenomena. But um, but we spend a couple of hours here in this room and we look back into the historical records and we find cases that are just as good with mm -hmm. multiple different technologies right. used to corroborate okay. eyewitness data collected and testimony ah, provided. Yeah. Okay, there oh, you go. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's a depiction of what we saw in 1969 in massachusetts wow That's which uh ended up becoming the first case in the united states to be deemed historically true wow by state government well see there you go once again speaking to that very point tom i mean you know the history of this phenomena affords us data that it again it's incumbent upon us as modern researchers with our modern toolkit and right. modern yeah. analytic capabilities to go back revisit some of these and look at them and, and, you know, compare, contrast, and, and, and combine, really, with the modern reports so that we can mm -hmm. see a fuller picture and get a broader perspective on, really, the provenance of the phenomenon, you know, its right. characteristics and any patterns and correlations that emerge. Well, I thought it was interesting because, you know, we talked earlier about uh, a craft that, uh, you know, David had mentioned, which had, like, uh, 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 I guess, uh, panels to it kind of thing mm -hmm. and how there was a redness to it and this had a red sheen that came out of the shell of it itself it wasn't a projecting a light it just had a color to it off off center and uh what you'd like to talk to with, with you about more but i guess you know we're kind of running late so uh <laughs> you know you know one hour turned into two and it's awesome <laughs> so, what happened when you got this guy on the show huh? no, no, no. That's it, still you packed, know, you know, and, and it's, and, and it's really great you know to, to dive into the data well and there's real the substance here there's some serious right, substance right. Here. Absolutely. You know, and, uh, you know, to, to Micah's point, uh, if the government's not going to start looking at the history, we're going to continue to do the historical work. And uh, in fact, I'll be meeting uh, very soon with Senator Martin Heinrich, as I alluded to uh, earlier in the show, and uh, going to educate him on what we're doing and what the organization represents, namely the historical preservation and centralization of this data. And mm -hmm. uh, for anyone that's interested in it. Fantastic. Do you have anything well, more to um, all I want to say is uh, thank you very much for your efforts in establishing this National UFO Historical Research Center. It's That's been a lot of work. Not I to say, but I've got it. <laughs> yeah, and keep doing so because I'm sure in the future I'll be referring back to you for some research and Tom as well um, because we're trying to get the information out to those outside the UFO community. You Mainstream. Know, the, the new people that are coming into it, or maybe even people that aren't coming into it yet, but soon will, because right. I think it's going to change everybody's worldview when the truth finally hits the fan. Right. right. Yeah, There's a lot of interest on it now. Everyone's running around with a, a cell phone. They have access to everything, news immediately. So if you mention something, they can call it up. Nobody wants stories anymore, I don't think. I think people want substance. I mean, there's always those that want to go on a late night show and right. hear how whatever. Um, right. But when it comes to the facts and the history and what's really happening and what's important, um, I don't think there's enough of that. You know, we're right. trying to do do the same thing to some degree. Absolutely. But um, for you to have all these archives and, and uh, to be putting together what you are and the time and effort that goes into that, that's quite commendable. So, yeah, you know, and personally, we, you know, thank you. And, and no, we, thank you. Yeah, we both want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. Absolutely. Spending your uh, time with us. A Saturday and night. You are more than welcome to come back again. We'd love to have you back on so we can dig deeper into the phenomenon. Absolutely. Both of you, Micah, Absolutely. you as well. Um, I hope you enjoyed your intro because I want to make sure you <laughs> had one. <laughs> yeah. I, I did indeed. That was a surprise, man. A welcome one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you're more than welcome. I have to do one thing here before I forget. Um, I have so much material in front of me. So let's see here. I got to thank the members of my channel. Absolutely. So here are the members of my channel Joshua 420, Angel Wings, My Flock is Everywhere, or Sarah, Jennifer Sosi, 
Cable Guy, W. Decker, Simone Maxim, RDN Medic 1968, Beats or Nanine 101. She likes to be called either or. <laughs> and Mr. D.B. Cooper 77. Okay. And I do have a thank you clip for them. Tom knows this clip. So this will bring you back, uh, David and Micah. Had to thank my members. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, if you want to subscribe to the channel, it really helps us out. If you want to donate to uh, the National UFO uh, Historical Research Center, uh, you can send donations to P.O. Box 15541, Rio Rancho, New Mexico, 87174. Or they are connected to a link on Amazon. Uh, you can find that link on their, let's see here, on their website, which is www.nufohrc.org. Uh, they're connected to Amazon Smiles, so anything that you buy off of that, through that link, um, the donations will, a percentage of the, don of the money will go to them as a donation to help them preserve these records and get them out to the people which is what we all want so please check out the link okay so i want to thank everybody in the chat room mm -hmm. who who participated this evening i want to thank everyone online who participated and i want to thank you david and i want to thank you mike sure. thank you very much for your time and your efforts in this matter and we hope yeah. you come back again Thank you for giving Thanks us so much, guys. Closure. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tom. Sincerely, thank, thank you. Okay. All my best. And Talk soon. Here we go. Uh, good night. See you next week.